Hello everyone, welcome back to Understanding Cancer Season 2. Today it's Lecture 4 and we will be discussing about receptor activation. So let's have a recap on last week's lesson. So what you hopefully should understand so far from Lecture 3 is that cell-to-cell -cell communication consists of direct paracrine a contact dependent autocrine and endocrine signaling pathways. Cell signaling has three key steps receptor activation, signal transduction, and cellular response. This regulation of cellular signal transduction pathways underlies most of the hallmarks of cancer. There are different types of signaling pathways and vary based on the distance traveled to reach the target cells. Protein-based ligands are insoluble in the membrane and does not enter the cell. Fat-based ligands are soluble and pass through the membrane. So what will we learn today? Today we'll hopefully learn what is a receptor, where are receptors found, what factors affect the binding between the receptor and ligand, types of receptors, types of ligands, and other types of ligands. So a gentle reminder that an ideal way of learning is to divide the lecture over across the week. And there's a various mini lectures at approximate total time will take one hour in total. And yeah, hopefully you can challenge yourself with a quiz. So let's have a recap on how you can support your learning. So there are key facts with diagrams by HN Designs presented in a simplified way. There is also a glossary to help you understand any key words that you, you don't know their meanings. There's also revision posters to summarize key facts. There's also quizzes to test your knowledge and reflect to see how far you understand. And there is also a reference list for further reading. A special thanks to my parents, the rest of the family, the friends and colleagues for their support and also the respected teachers and health professions who taught me and installed the passion of cancer within me. So what is a receptor? A receptor is a type of protein and it undergoes a change known as conformational change. And this occurs when, you, when it actually binds with a ligand and the ligand is a signaling molecule. And there are two types of ligands. It can be a protein or a steroid, which we'll be discussing later. So the ligand is considered as the first messenger because it's the initial signal that first binds to the receptor to become activated before it can make further steps to elicit a response. So here you can see a diagram where you have an inactive receptor. So this, is, this type of receptor is a cell surface receptor. So the inactive receptor, because there's no ligand attached to it, but then when it is activated, you can see that it, 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 it ignites um, a further reaction such as signal in, uh, transduction, and all that process requires energy. So receptor activation is the first step in cell communication. The subsequent step is signal transduction followed by cellular response. So where are the receptors found? Most receptors are actually found on the surface of the membrane. And another place where you can actually find is they can be found inside the cells, so intracellular. 
So this occurs if the ligand is able to bypass the plasma membrane in order to bind to the receptor and to initiate the following up steps. What factors affect the binding between the receptor and ligand? There are two main factors that affect the process and the, the, the ligand and the receptor is a rapid process and the position of red ligand binds to the receptor is key and the ability to have the energy to maintain sufficiency and also to lead on to the signal transduction where there's proteins and cascades taking place uh, in order to activate and elicit a response. Now if you look at this diagram over here, you can see that the ligand has been placed in various position, but because it hasn't been positioned in the right way, in the right orientation, it's inactive. Now when it's been added to the ligand binding site in the extracellular domain, you can see that it's now active. And the extracellular domain is uh, the area where the ligand uh, um, binding site is found. Now, cell-to-cell -cell communication varies in the method and distance the signal is traveling. And an equation is a way in how you can present the relationship between the different factors. So here we have an equation that presents the link between ligand and receptor. So when a ligand and receptor join together, it forms a complex. Yeah. And K is rate. Okay. So K on is the rate of binding occurs between the ligand and the receptor, because they're the two uh, reactants. And K off that's the rate of the dissociation or the release that occurs. So what that means is that the ligand and receptor to form a ligand and receptor complex and a ligand and receptor complex to break down to form the ligand and receptor, if there's equal rates. And the KD value is a dissociation or the equilibrium constant between the ligand and the receptor. So let's look at types of receptors. Now, there are three main types of receptors, enzyme coupled receptor, ligand gated ion channels and G protein coupled receptors. So where are enzyme coupled receptors found? They are found within living cells, especially eukaryotes. And eukaryotes, examples of that is plants, animals, fungi. And there are two domains in the receptor. There's the extracellular, which means that it's outside the cell. And there's intracellular, which means that there is inside the cell. And the function of the extracellular domain is to bind to the ligand. The function of the intracellular domain is to initiate enzyme activity. So it's like it has a catalytic function. Okay. So an enzyme is a type of protein and the role of it is to help increase the speed of the reaction. To combine the extracellular domain as well as the intracellular domain, there is a structure called a transmembrane alpha helix. So that's what connects both roles together. And a key example of this is tyrosine kinase receptor. So the enzyme activity consists of the ty tyrosine kinase domain, and you can see there's two uh, um, codes that symbolizes tyrosine because every amino acid has its own um, uh, coded value. 
So U A U and U A C. So depending on what type of learner you are, after try to provide um, two ways in how you can present this. So the first way is based upon um, the key steps involved without any diagrams. And then the second example is a learning technique where you can um, observe the images and understand why each process takes place. So first the receptor unlike and bind, then a conformational change occurs at the extracellular domain of the receptor. The two receptor molecules then associate together, this is called dimerization. This affects the conformation of the intracellular domain where the tyrosine kinase activity is on. So enzymes are proteins made up of amino acids. One particular amino acid is tyrosine, and this is where um, photosynthesis takes place. Now tyrosine kinases are enzymes that transfer phosphate groups. So they phosphorylate. And this occurs from ATP to a protein. They can also phosphorylate each other, and that is known as autophosphorylation. Now, if we look in terms of images over here, you can see there's the first image uh, where the receptor ligand binds. You can see that um, there is an inactive receptor, there's a plasma membrane, and then there's a um, uh, tyrosine kinase activity. So there is no ligand present. But then, when you add in the ligand and they bind them together, and it, uh, this occurs with two uh, uh, receptors, you can see that now the receptors are both activated. And there's a conformational change that occurs at the extracellular domain. Now in the third image, where they both attach with the ligand, what they do, they come close together, close proximity, and then they dimerize. So they bind together, and this is what causes a conformational change, this time in the intracellular domain. That's when the enzyme activity is on. Yeah. So at first, there's a conformation change at the extracellular domain. That's when the first messenger, which is the ligand, like, binds to the uh, receptor. And then when that occurs and you bring the two receptors together to make form a dimer, that causes a change now inside uh, with intracellular domain and it activates the enzyme. So what happens next? There is a phosphorylation takes place. So how does that happen? Well, the energy source, which is ATP, adenosine triphosphate, okay, that breaks down or hydrolyzes to form ADP plus phosphate. Okay. So when you have the intercellular domain, where there's an enzyme activity taking place over there, what they do, they transfer the phosphate group, which they hydrolyze from ATP, to the protein. And when that takes place, you form a phosphorylated protein. They can also phosphorylate each other, and that is known as autophosphorylation. Okay, so you can see in the first image, we've got phosphate groups being attached to the um, to the, 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 the tyrosine um, uh, uh, kinase domain, and then you have the protein as a result of this gets phosphorylated. Yeah, so the ATP loses a phosphate group, 
and gives it away so energy can then be provided. So let's have a look at a step back. So in the first lecture, we looked at the shots of the DNA, we talked about bases, bonding, and so on. So we're using the same key. So the yellow is nitrogen is base, and as you should be aware, there's four main types of bases that are found within a DNA. So you've got thiamine, adenine, guanine, cytosine. So purines are adenine and guanine. The pyrimidines are thiamine and cytosine. Now the sugar molecule is a type of pentose sugar. You got the name pentose sugar because pent because it's five sided and it, there is um, sugar. Okay, so it's, it's a sugar molecule. And this type of five carbon sugar is known as ribose. And there's a variety of different types of uh, phosphorylated nucleotide. ATP and GTP are mainly involved with energy. Okay. However, with thymidine triphosphate and cytosine phosphate, what happens to those two, the pyrimidines, is that they are more involved within the DNA synthesis. Whereas ATP and GTP, they're more involved in terms of the energy. So when you attach a sugar with the base, what you do is you form a nucleoside because there's no phosphate group. So instead of forming adenine, you're forming adenosine. And instead of guanine, it's called guanosine. And at this stage, there is no phosphate. Now, when you add a phosphate group, what happens is you form a nucleotide. So a base plus sugar plus a phosphate groups forms a nucleotide. Okay. An example of this is with the DNA. With the DNA is a genetic material and it consists of two strands that consists of many, many of these nucleotides that are complementary bound. And because you only have one phosphate, you call it guanosine monophosphate or adenosine monophosphate. So mono meaning one. Now in the fourth image, you can see that there was an addition of another phosphate group. So you cannot call it adenosine monophosphate or guanosine monophosphate anymore. Because now you have two, so it's a di. So this is where it comes in, adenosine diphosphate, guanosine diphosphate. Here you have three phosphate groups now. So it's a tri because it's three. So in here you have adenosine triphosphate, guanosine triphosphate. So energy is released when ATP is hydrolyzed, split or divided to form ADP plus a phosphate molecule. And the breakdown of ATP to form ADP plus a phosphate is known as ATP hydrolase or ATPase. Let's now progress on to ligand gated ion channels. So ion channels are proteins, so they're a type of proteins and what they do is they allow the movement of ions Okay, for sort of transport. And it achieves this by a process called diffusion. 
So just as a recap from last week's lesson, diffusion is the movement of uh, particles from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration down a concentration gradient. So ions are atoms that have either lost or gained electrons. So if it's a metal, it forms a positive ion. If it's a non-metal, it forms a negative ion. And the channels open when the ligand binds to the receptor. Some ligands are able to pass through the plasma membrane and bind to intercellular receptors. So in the first image, you can see there's an inactive receptor. There's a place where the ligand can bind. There's also the plasma membrane and the cytoplasm. In the second image, you can see that the ligand has bound with the receptor and that's made it active. And when it's made it active, what that's done, it leads on to for the ion channels to open its door and allow the flow of the ions to enter. So where are ligand gated ion channels found? There are two common places where it's normally found. The first place is nerve and muscle cells, and the second is between two nerve cells. So here you have an example of a nerve cell known as motor neuron. Now you won't go too much in depth in this, because that requires another lesson um, on this subject specifically. But there are three main types of um, uh, neurons. You have sensory, you have relay, and you have the uh, motor neuron. The sensory neuron, this is what is, um, you know, passes the information from the sensory organ to the uh, central nervous system, which is the processing center. Now, within the central nervous system in the processing center, there is the brain and a spinal cord. Now, the brain needs to send the message to the spinal cord to be able to coordinate a response because they work together. And the motor neuron is once the uh, brain and spinal cord has made a, a decision, what happens is, is that the, um, the impulses or the messages leaves the central nervous system and then it travels to the effector. And there's two types of effectors. There's a muscle and there's a gland. Yeah. So here in the image, you can see that the position of the cell body is in a difference because there's different types of neurons. And on the other opposite side to the cell body, you can see there's a muscle fiber there. And you can see the skeletal uh, muscle overall. So the skeletal muscle is mainly involved in movement, so contraction. The periodic table has been developed by a chemist called Dimitri Mendeleev. Okay, so this is where you can find all of the elements to date, and they are positioned based on their properties. So, chemical and physical properties. There is also that there is some of them are found naturally, and some need to be extracted, such as, for example, an ore. Now, on the left hand side, you can see there's the metals in yellow. So they all have the ability to form uh, a positive ion. OK, so they have a plus sign. But that depends on the uh, number of electrons it has. So, for example, with potassium and sodium, they are both in group one. Okay. 
and they have similar properties to one another. With nonmetals, so on the right hand side, they gain electrons and become negative ions. An example of this would be chlorine. Now, may, one may be thinking is that if they're going to lose an electron, isn't that supposed to be negative? And if they're gaining something, isn't that supposed to be positive? Well, psychologically, yes. But when it comes into chemistry, it's different. The reason being is, for example, sodium is in group one. So it has one electron in its outer shell. And to have a stable shell, you need eight electrons. Okay, so eight electrons in the second, third, fourth shell. In the first shell, the maximum you can have is two electrons. Now, on the very last shell, so that's the energy level, and within the middle, you can find the protons and neutrons. So the protons are positively charged uh, subatomic particles, and the neutrons have no charge. And surrounding it, you've got these circles called en uh, energy uh, levels or electron shells. So this is where you can find the electrons being present. And when you just have one, it's very unstable because you can readily lose it. So the more electrons you have on the shell, the more stable it is. So this is why it becomes Na+. Plus because it loses an electron to become a positive ion. And a positive ion is known as cation. Now, chlorine, on the other hand, is found in group 7 within the periodic table. It has more electrons on its outer shell. So it has seven altogether. And to have a complete full shell, you require eight. So you can't really lose any of these electrons there because it's very, very closely, nearly complete. So non-metals, they gain electrons and they become a negative ion known as anion. So how you can uh, remember it is that onion, uh, so onion, if you start cutting an onion, he makes it cry. So you can say that the negative ion yeah and it lacks one electron to become a complete shell so if you for example there's a reaction that occurs between sodium and chlorine sodium generously donates its uh, uh, electron to chlorine and sodium becomes more stable, and so does chlorine. Now, let's look at an example using a neurotransmitter such as acetylcholine. Now, acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter, and a neurotransmitter is what transmits a chemical message. And last lesson, we discussed that between two nerve cells, we've got a space called the synapse. And this space is where the chemical impulse takes place. And it requires neurotransmitters to pass on the message. Now, acetylcholine is involved in, uh, for example, uh, muscular functions such as movements. It's also involved in uh, the brain functions such as learning, thinking, and uh, memory. So in the first image, there's an inactive or resting ion channel. The reason being, there's no ligand bound to the ligand binding site. Okay, so the gate's closed. Now in the second image, you can see that the, um, the ligand um, binding channel has been activated because the acetylcholine comes along and binds specifically to its site. 
Now, as a result of this, there's an excitement coming along. And it allows the flow of ions to pass through. So now the sodium ions, Na+, can pass through. And also the calcium ions, Ca2+, because it's in group 2 at the periodic table, also passes through. Then inactive occurs again. That only occurs if the levels of the ions that enters the um, uh, channel is a lot more concentrated. Yeah. So in order to control the levels of the acetylcholine, there's an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase, and that helps lower the acetyl uh, levels. So let's progress to the food type of receptor, that street protein coupled receptor. Now, instead of having one transmembrane, they have seven. So they vary in structure in comparison to the um, uh, enzyme coupled receptor. And what they do, they interact with intracellular proteins called G proteins. Gentle reminder that intracellular means inside the cell. Now these G proteins, they interact with a type of nucleotide called guanosine triphosphate, which is involved in producing energy. So let's have some images to support your learning. So the ligand binds to the receptor at the cell surface. Structure of the um, G protein there. So in the G protein, you can see that there is a GDP. Yeah. So there's a guanosine diphosphate there. So there's two phosphate groups with ribose sugar and the guanine base. And Attached to that, you have an alpha subunit and you also have a, a, a gamma, um, a beta gamma dimer. So what happens is the GPCR binds to the G protein to release GDP. And when it releases GDP, it then binds onto GTP. So this is what makes the G protein activated. Because now, instead of GDP, you've got the GTP attached to the alpha subunits of the, of the G protein. Now, GTP then causes a conformational change where it splits G protein. So how? Well, the base and, and the dimer go one way and the beta and the gamma goes another way. And when they, when this is conducted, this helps interaction with other proteins, which leads onto a cascade in a signal transduction. So what happens next? The ligand then degrades and separates from the receptor. The alpha subunits hydrolyzes GTP and turn it back to GDP and P. The alpha subunit and the beta gamma reunite together to form an inactive G protein. So let's now progress on to types of ligands. The first type of ligand is small hydrophilic molecules. So hydrophilic is water soluble. It means that it's water loving. However, it cannot pass through the plasma membrane. And that's because of the molecular size. So they need cell surface receptors and most associate with the extracellular domain so this is where you can find the ligand binding domain and key examples of small hydrophilic molecules are small molecules peptides and proteins 
So in this image over here, you can see there's an inactive receptor and then there's an active receptor because the ligand has been bound and it's that initiates um, energy release. Small hydrophobic molecules. So the, what happens is they are able to bind to carry proteins. Okay, so, and this helps them reach the target cells. They also directly diffuse through the plasma membrane and target um, uh, cells and interact with intercellular receptors. So uh, this is an idea of how the small hydrophobic molecules function. And the receptors can be found within a cytoplasm rating and then after that, it travels to the nucleus. And then you have other steroid hormones that bind to receptors in the nucleus. So steroid hormones. Steroid hormones are lipids that have a hydrocarbon bound with four rings. So hydrocarbon is, means that it consists of hydrogen and carbon atoms only. So different steroids have different functional groups. And there are a variety of examples of different steroids. The first example is estrogen. So that's produced in a female reproductive system. There's testosterone. That's produced in a male reproductive system. Cholesterol is a structural part of membranes, and it also helps produce steroid hormones. The thyroid hormone, that helps regulate activities and the metabolic rate. But that's in reference to the total expenditure so the total expenditure is the total energy used by the actual body. And then vitamin D, the bone and uh, teeth development. And this can be done by regulating the calcium iron levels. So we mentioned that steroid hormones are hydrocarbon bound with four rings. So here in the first image, you can see there is four rings. And you can, there is the um, uh, a group attached to it, which consists of just hydrogen and carbon present. There were other examples of steroid hormones, so there's aldosterone, so that's involved in the uh, regulating uh, the sodium levels. There's also cortisol, so that's the stress hormone. There's testosterone. Uh, estrogen and progesterone. So in all of these, you can see they have the, the basic, which is the uh, four rings. Okay, but they vary in terms of the different functional groups. Let's look at the other types of ligands. So nitric oxide is different in comparison to, for example, if it's a protein or a steroid, because this is a gas, you know. So it's a gas that can also act as a ligand, and it's able to diffuse directly across the uh, plasma membrane, and that's due to its size, and it mainly interacts with the receptors in a smooth muscle. So there are three different types of muscles. You have the skeletal muscle, which is involved in um, contraction or movements. You have the heart muscle and you have the smooth muscle. The smooth muscle, you commonly find this within the, uh, um, the digestive system, especially within the intestines. You can also see it in the, um, in the uh, large blood vessels and the large blood vessels are known as the um, arteries so they carry blood with high levels of oxygen around the tissues that need the energy um so these are um, examples of smooth muscles and what happens is is when it interacts with the receptors in a smooth muscle it causes it to uh, relax and how it achieves this is by dilating or expanding the blood vessels. And this helps restore the blood flow to the heart. And it's also short 
half-life and functions over short distances. So by the end of this lecture, what you should understand is that receptor activation is the first step of cell-to-cell -cell communication, i.e. cell signaling. The ligand is the first messenger that could be a protein or a steroid and can complementary bind it with the receptor like a lock and key. Some receptors are found on the cell surface and other receptors are found inside the cells, for example, within the nucleus and the cytoplasm. Some ligands are hydrophilic, for example, proteins, um, and uh, they cannot diffuse through the plasma membrane due to their size, and therefore they require cell surface receptors. However, as ligands are hydrophobic, i.e. steroid hormones, so they can diffuse through the plasma membrane and interact with the intercellular receptors. Now, the rate of the ligand between a ligand and receptor equals the rate of the releasing the ligand from the receptor. Here is some references for further reading. Next lesson, we will be discussing signal transjection and cellular response. I hope you enjoyed the uh, lecture this week and you find it beneficial. Please do not hesitate to utilize the glossary for any key terms you misunderstand. Please do also um, uh, do check out the posters, also the quiz. Um, and if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to email me. Thank you very much. Take care. See you next week.